SocialStudiesGames.us, Unit 7, Video 5, as always, based on the AP History Guidelines. Today, I can compare and contrast Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois, define the Great Migration, list the push-pull factors that led to the Great Migration. We're going to talk about Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois, but this is a simplified explanation. And this is what you get in fourth grade social studies. And unfortunately, this is what you get according to the AP Guidelines, because there's so much to study. And this is not just these specific individuals. It's many of the individuals that we study throughout history. We don't necessarily anymore focus on individual biographies. We're more concerned with events and actions and bigger themes. The result of which is that we don't really go in depth into some very interesting, important figures like Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. And so when we simplify things, we often exaggerate differences. And so sometimes we misconstrue this to think that, oh, W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington were the opposites and they were enemies and they did not have the same cause. That is incorrect. That is a result of simplifying our understanding of these guys because we are limited in time, but also because that's what we do because we are limited in time. And so when you simplify people, you want to stand out, you create exaggerations, and those exaggerations have kind of taken us in different directions. So if you are interested in what you hear, if this opens the door to you for W.E.B. Du Bois or Booker T. Washington or both, then I encourage you to search the internet, many books you can find out about these guys' careers and the things that they did and the ways that they help change society. But again, this is going to be simplified, slightly exaggerated, not the best representation, but it will be the best representation to give you an understanding of what's happening and also help you for your APS, AP US history guidelines. Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, they will have separate plans. Again, exaggerating them, and you would really want to read a biography to find out exactly what they want to do. But for the most part, Booker T. Washington wanted to achieve equality for black Americans or African Americans at the turn of the century. This is going into the 1900s, 1900s, 19 teens, into the 1920s. So roughly 120-ish years ago, Booker T. Washington starting the push for equal rights for African Americans or black Americans. We talked the other day about equal rights for women. We're now talking about black Americans. Booker T. Washington has a different plan than what W.E.B. Du Bois will propose. Washington says, we're not going to protest. We're not going to be politically active. We're not going to demand equal rights. That's not the best way of achieving equality. That is his stance. Now, that's the fourth grade social studies, the AP guidelines, what they'll teach you in high school. The reality is he did believe in protest. That's not in your book. That's not in regular classes. He supported this, but he couldn't support this because Booker T. Washington wasn't in control of the Tuskegee Institute. He believed in education and educating black Americans, lifting them up, empowering them so that they had a role in the economy, so they had a role in society. But it started with education, then it moved to the economy, into federal jobs, and then into society. They would slowly, black America would lift up and white America would have to accept black America as equals when they noticed with their eyes and saw the results of, oh, they are equal to me. That was his plan. But in order to do that requires education and schools cost money. And Booker T. Washington was dependent on a lot of different donors, some white donors, some donors in the deep South. And if Booker T. Washington would have protested and supported protests, he would have lost that money. He would have lost his school. It was simply something he could not do. Underneath, secretly, he helped finance many protests. He helped finance many court cases. He did a lot to support the politically active but we don't know about that because he could not let that be seen. He said in confidence that if he wanted to start a race war, he had the power to be politically active and start a race war the very next day. But he knew that wasn't going to help the cause and that went against what he wanted to do and his plan for education, economic gain, and eventually proving the equality or the equalness naturally of blacks and whites so that eventually the law would have to reflect what is actually happening. So again, he could have been politically active, but he's in a situation where he's running a school in the deep south, not really something that he could have done and been successful. So he doesn't do that. And what we get is the Atlanta Compromise. And this says that the Southern blacks would submit to white political rule. We'll let the whites run the local governments. We'll let the whites run the state governments. We'll let them run the federal government. They can do their government thing as long as we get it. You guys are in control. 
But what we ask is you need to guarantee that we can get an education. Again, that's a big thing with Booker T. Washington. We've got to get educated. We've got to learn math. We've got to learn science. We've got to understand civics. We have to become literate. With those tools, with that human capital that Thomas Sowell is always talking about, it's about human capital. I can give you $10,000, but it's probably not going to help you because you're going to spend it. And then when the money's gone, you're nowhere. But if you have human capital, if you have a skill, that will live with you for the rest of your life. If you can read, if you can write, if you can do advanced mathematics, if you understand science, you are going to have that for the rest of your life. That's going to open doors everywhere. When that $10,000 is gone, it's not going to open doors anymore. You can't just give money to people. But Booker T. Washington understands this. Thomas Sowell understands this, talks about this in all of his books. It's about human capital. It's not about money. People can take your money away. People can take your car away. They can take your house away. They can take your things away and they're gone, but they cannot take away your human capital, your education, your knowledge for all that you're getting, get understanding. And Booker T. Washington understood that. We'll submit to white rule, but if we can get education and we can get due process of law, and that's basically Due process is if the government takes something away, mainly your life, your liberty, your pursuit of happiness, you get a trial. You get to follow legal standing. They can't just throw people in jail. They just can't execute people. They can't just uh, lynch people. Let us get our education and give us due process, which means a process of law. If you're proving that I'm doing something wrong, if I've been unfairly treated, I get a process. And in most cases, that's a criminal case or a criminal trial or a civil trial. Basically, it means the government can't do what, look, we're going to let the whites run the government, the white people in our country. We're going to submit and say, you can run the government. But if you're running the government, you must follow the rules. You must follow a process of law. You can't make it up as you go. That's part of the deal. We'll let you guys run the show, but let us get an education and follow the rules, follow the process. And we guarantee that we're not going to demand equality we're not going to fight for integration right now, and we're not going to fight for justice. We'll do our thing, although it's not necessarily fair, but we need this right now. If we get education and due process, that opens the door. That gives us an opportunity to slowly work our way towards equality. A lot of people don't like this idea by Booker T. Washington. They're like, no, you need it now. We want it now. Life is unfair. And Washington understood that, but he realized that just demanding – Equality, if they had equality the very next day, if the rules and the laws were all equal, black Americans, especially in the South, didn't have the human capital to continue to grow. They still needed education. And he thought it was better to get the human capital first, then get the equality instead of demanding it today. So again, we'll let the white rule. This is the Atlanta Compromise. Through education, African Americans will be able to fill jobs. Through jobs, African Americans or Black Americans will be able to live wherever they want, spend wherever they want, and slowly integrate themselves as opposed to the government integrating Black America. Black America will pull itself into society instead of having the government force Black America into the society, force equality. He believes in more of a natural, organic, equality where it's earned. Now, some people say you shouldn't have to earn it. Everyone should be equal. And I completely understand that. But should is often a word we shouldn't use. Sometimes things don't work the way that they're supposed to work. Booker T. Washington was a realist. He understood that racism was very strong in this nation and that if the government tells people stop being racist, it's probably not going to happen. You may know that in your own life. If the government, if the police, if the school tells a racist to stop being racist, they're probably not going to change. And it's hard to force someone to stop being racist. But if the racist slowly realizes over time that other people are equal, then maybe that racist will change. That's what Booker T. Washington's plan. It's up to you. Now, through this, eventually, then you can have activism. W.E. Du Bois plan for equality focused basically on the Niagara movement. And it was, no, we need to demand change now. We need the government to be active. We are equal citizens. The government must protect our life, our liberty, our pursuit of happiness. 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 They must protect us. That's what they should do. We shouldn't be second-class citizens. And people are being lynched. Society is segregated. We can't just wait. We can't just take our time. Change the laws now, and we will continue to work and rise up. 
but this stuff is intolerable. We can no longer sit back idly. We must be active and tell the government now, change the law. We must be allowed to vote. We must stop the lynching. We must desegregate society. This was W.E.B. Du Bois. Different from the slow and steady education-based, economic-based uh, accommodation is the name for the Booker T. Washington plan. Accommodation. That's not what W.E.B. Du Bois stands for. Eventually, the Niagara Movement will create what is called the NAACP, the National Association, the NASA, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, still around today, a black organization or an organization that represents black Americans in terms of civil rights, inequality, basically in any schools, any way that you can imagine. This is a very strong organization that fights for equality still today. And an example here was this organization lobbied to get the president to stop lynching and make it illegal. And so Woodrow Wilson passed a law that stopped this, but Woodrow Wilson, throw a little shade here. It's like writing history with lightning. And my only regret is that it's all so terribly true. He says this about a movie that's about the KKK. He talks about, he is a historian. He was a university president. He is a progressive. He also believed in eugenics and he praises, he praises a movie about the KKK. Now, We'll give him one little thing before we completely destroy him. Probably one of the worst presents ever. One thing that does it that might kind of give him a little bit of, it's tough. I mean, because he's it's, it's racist. But this is the very first big time movie ever made. So, of course, he's like, yeah, it's amazing. Like, it's the first movie ever. The for, uh, first, first, W D.W. Griffiths movie is, this is it. Movies did not exist. Full-length movies, big-time productions did not exist. It's kind of crazy that the first giant movie made in America paints the KKK as heroes. Crazy. Unbelievable. You can watch the movie online. Incredibly racist. Beyond racist. The most racist thing that you will ever see. Blackface, Ku Klux Klan. I mean, it's it's so horribly offensive. There's a scene where they have a black man, and you can find the clips here online. The black man, which is actually a white man with black face paint, is chasing this white woman, and they're making him look like an animal and a crazed animal that's going to rape her. Incredibly offensive. The woman chooses to jump from a cliff and commit suicide rather than be attacked by, and I'm putting this in quotations, the beast. Terribly offensive. You can watch it online. It's almost laughable because it's so terrible. But then you realize that the president talks about, this is a great movie. Are you kidding me? The president of the United States is watching it in the White House talking about how amazing it is. That tells you about race relations and racism 120 years ago. You think it's bad today. And I know people talk about our current president. He's a racist. Okay. You, you can believe what you want. That is fine. As long as you've got evidence to support your belief, you're not just calling people racist. Don't do that. If you know someone has done specific racist actions and you find them, and there probably is some stuff. If you find it, then that's fine. Label them as a racist. But this pales in comparison to Woodrow Wilson in the White House watching a KKK movie. Do you think racism is nearly as bad as it was then? We lynched people a hundred, let's careful the word we, Americans without due process lynched black Americans 120 years ago. Today, we have race problems. There is racism. We have issues, but we don't have this.